Nuclear fusion is the holy grail for the ultimate clean energy power source. Virtually limitless clean power that's fueled by seawater and is much safer than fission nuclear reactors that we have today. So what's not to like? Probably the fact that they don't exist yet, it costs billions of dollars for the research, and we always seem to be perpetually 30 years away from having a working reactor. It's a common joke that we're always 30 years away, and one that I saw a lot in the comments on my solid state battery video. There have been some exciting breakthroughs over the past few years, so are we really stuck 30 years away from fusion reactors forever? I'm Matt Farrell, welcome to Undecided. I'm going to keep this higher level because nuclear physics is clearly a very complex topic that's out of scope for this video, and my channel, and my brain. I'll include some links in the description for some details and explanations if you're interested, but here's how it works at a high level. Fission is what happens when a neutron slams into a larger atom, which splits it into two smaller atoms. Additional neutrons are also released in this process and can start a chain reaction by slamming into more atoms to continue the process. When an atom is split, a massive amount of energy is released, which generates heat. In the nuclear reactors that we have today around the world, the heat is captured to turn water into steam, which then turns a turbine and produces electricity. Fusion is the opposite of fission, and it's what's happening in our sun and all stars in the universe. Fusion is when two atoms slam together to form a heavier atom. Fusion reactors can use deuterium and tritium. When heated to 150 million degrees and slammed into each other, they produce helium and a neutron. Fission reactions don't occur normally in nature, but as I mentioned before, fusion does, and it occurs in stars. One big benefit of fusion over fission is that it doesn't produce highly radioactive fission products. It's also safer because of how the nuclear chain reaction behaves. In fission, the chain reaction of splitting atoms can get out of control, which will either cause an explosion or a reactor meltdown and release massive amounts of radioactive particles for years and decades into the future. While nuclear reactors are very safe in practice, there have been several notable examples of what can happen if something goes wrong. All you have to do is look at Three Mile Island in 1979, Chernobyl in 1986, or Fukushima in 2011. Fusion reactions, however, are very different. It takes a massive amount of heat to create plasma in the center of a fusion reactor. Plasma is superheated matter that gets so hot, it rips electrons away from the atoms, forming an ionized gas. The freed nuclei, which are positively charged and usually repel from each other, start bouncing around at great speeds and confuse together, which releases energy in the process. If a fusion reaction becomes unstable or unbalanced, it naturally slows down, dropping the temperature until it stops. The worst case scenario is damage to the fusion reactor and the immediate surroundings, but very little else. But the safety benefits aren't the only reasons we're working to build fusion reactors. Instead of using something like uranium and plutonium as a fuel source, fusion reactors can use deuterium and tritium. Both deuterium and tritium can be extracted from seawater and lithium, and so there's enough fusion fuel on Earth to power the planet for millions of years. So what's the catch? Well, it's a big one. We haven't been able to produce a fusion reaction in an energy efficient and sustained way yet. It takes more energy to generate the heat and pressure needed to create the fusion reaction than the energy we get out of it. This is referred to as the fusion energy gain factor. It's the ratio of energy to maintain the reaction versus what it's actually producing, which is often expressed by the symbol Q. So a Q of one would be break even. A Q of two would double the energy that you put in, and a Q that's less than one would mean a loss of energy. In 2017, the record for Q was set by the Jet Tokamak reactor in the UK, which was a Q of 0.67. But there's a lot of nuance to that because these reactions and experiments are running on cheaper hybrid forms of fuel, which aren't as efficient as deuterium and tritium. So researchers also have calculations that they use to estimate real-world performance with things like extrapolated break-even, engineering break-even, and commercial break-even. Again, that's all out of scope for this video, but I'll include links in the description if you're interested. But that's not the end of the catch. We've been researching and experimenting with fusion since the 1930s. That's right, almost 90 years. But the first fusion devices didn't show up until the 1950s. When people joke that fusion energy is always 30 years away, this is why. The predictions for when fusion energy gain factor would be at a workable level has been wrong again and again. A lot of times these predictions are coming from researchers trying to get funding 
so there's some overselling going on in order to generate interest. It's important to look at this holistically. Saying that we'll never achieve fusion energy because we're always 30 years away is ignoring the actual progress that's been made. The overselling of the time frame has damaged fusion energy's perception. In the 1970s and 80s, we had several tokamak-style reactors built, which use a torus shape. It's kind of like a big donut. Homer Simpson would love it. The tube is ringed by giant magnets that create a magnetic field to confine the hot plasma used for the fusion reaction. Three of the more notable tokamaks are the Joint European Taurus, or JET, the Tokamak Fusion Test Reactor, or TFTR, in the US, and the JT-60 reactor in Japan. It was also in the 1980s when an international project was launched to build one of the largest tokamak reactors in the world, ITER. This 35-year collaboration between China, the EU, India, Japan, Korea, Russia, and the US is building on a facility in southern France that should be capable of achieving a Q greater than 10. If it works out like they're hoping, it should be able to generate about 500 megawatts of fusion power from 50 megawatts of input heating power. ITER itself is not meant to be a working reactor but a test facility to prove out the technologies and the design for the fusion power plants of the future. As exciting as that may sound, it's suffered from major cost overruns and delays. But as of right now, it's scheduled for its first plasma in December of 2025, and then ramping up to full operation by 2035. When you look at the progress that's been made over the past 50 years in fusion research, there's been an increase in plasma performance by a factor of 10,000 and we're about a factor of 10 away from having the core of a fusion power plant. If you put aside the crazy predictions of when specific people or researchers think we'll get working reactors, and you focus on the progress that's actually been made, that's when you see that it's a generational process. New advancements in material science, high-speed supercomputers, and modeling and simulation with the aid of machine learning are unlocking new approaches, quickly. In some cases, relaunching old approaches that had to be abandoned because certain technologies didn't exist yet. ITER is testing Magnetic Confinement Fusion, or MCF, at a massive scale. It's a tokamak that's using electromagnetic fields to confine the plasma into the reactor. Scaling up the size of the reactor should scale up the reaction and the energy. It's part of the reason the project is so expensive and taking so long. But on the flip side of this is to go smaller. In 2015, MIT proposed a new design for a compact tokamak fusion reactor. It creates a much stronger magnetic field using rare earth barium copper oxide superconducting tapes. That's a mouthful. This stronger magnetic field makes it possible to create and maintain the plasma in a smaller size. For a sense of scale, an arc reactor could achieve net energy gain in the system 2% the size of ITER. The smaller size means that the whole system is less expensive and faster to build, and MIT has spun off a company called Commonwealth Fusion Systems that's employing this in something they're calling a spark reactor. Then there are projects using inertial confinement fusion, or ICF, which uses powerful pulse lasers or ion beams to compress a fuel pellet to an extremely high density. The shockwave from the process heats the plasma. A British company called First Light Fusion is taking its inspiration for this type of design from a pistol shrimp. Yes, a shrimp. Not to get too far off track, but a pistol shrimp snaps its claw together so fast that it rips the water apart, creating a low pressure zone. Bubbles collect in this area and rapidly expand. The outside pressure of the surrounding water pushes back and collapses the bubbles. This vapor inside the low pressure zone is compressed to the point that plasma actually forms and reaches temperatures over 4,700 degrees Celsius. First Light Fusion is replicating this process in the reactor, but using a metal disc shaped projectile and a cube filled with a fuel source in a central cavity. The projectile's impact creates shock waves, which produce bubbles in the fuel, and as they collapse, the fuel inside is compressed enough to fuse. They're hoping to have a net energy gain demonstration by 2024. And one of the most recent fusion developments is around lasers. In 1985, Donna Strickland and Gerard Maru demonstrated chirped pulse amplification of lasers at the University of Rochester. Shout out to my hometown. The discovery gets petawatt-level performance out of an ultra-short laser, which was a game-changer for laser science. Up until that point, lasers had only been pushed to the megawatt and gigawatt levels. To put that in perspective, a kilowatt is 1,000 watts. A megawatt is 1,000 kilowatts. A gigawatt is 1,000 megawatts. A terawatt is 1,000 gigawatts. And a petawatt is 1,000 terawatts. This discovery won Strickland and Maru a Nobel Prize for Physics in 2018. 
This breakthrough in laser technology made an older fusion concept known as hydrogen boron 11 fusion, or HB11, possible. Emeritus Professor Heinrich Hora of University of South Wales in Sydney, Australia, has spoken of this concept since the 1960s. HB11 Energy is a company spun out from the university that has patents in the US, Japan, and China. Instead of needing to heat a deuterium tritium fuel to the temperature of the sun, lasers are used to speed hydrogen atoms into colliding with boron to begin a reaction. It wasn't until CPA lasers some 20 years later that this older idea became feasible. Where a tokamak reactor would be used to heat water to generate steam and turn a turbine, HB11's process would be generating electricity directly from the energy created from the hydrogen boron fusion. The end result would be a very small, efficient, and safe device. These aren't the only breakthroughs or reactor designs being tested, but some of the more interesting examples that I found of what's happened in fusion research in the past few years. Does that mean we'll have fusion reactors within 30 years? Who knows? I mean, your guess is as good as mine. But if you look at how far we've come from the first experiments to now, there's been an incredible amount of progress around a very complicated problem. And if, even if many of these companies hit their timelines and prove their designs in the next three to five years, which some of them are claiming, that doesn't mean we'll have commercially viable reactors working right away. Just as I talked about my solid state battery video, there's a gap between the lab and a commercialized product. Don't expect your home to be fusion powered anytime in the next 10 to 20 years. But we're gonna get very close to proving out the concept of the technology that's needed to make it work. And that's something to be really excited about and look forward to. Just take those time estimates with a massive grain of salt. If you like this video, be sure to check out my video on solid state batteries. That's another one where we keep getting promised the next big battery is almost here, but we keep waiting. Now jump into the comments and let me know what you think. And I'd also like to welcome Craig Sweetenham as one of my new Patreon producers. And as always, thanks so much for watching. I'll see you in the next one.